All righty, Lionel with you, and now I am so proud to bring to the microphones a man who needs no introduction, but will get one nonetheless. There was a play, off-Broadway play in New York called Mind Game, and I saw it last week, and it is nothing short of amazing. Keith Carradine joins us. It's a new thriller by Anthony Horowitz, directed by Ken Russell. I will go through your bona fides and your curriculum vitae, but you already <laughs> know it. Keith, welcome. Thank you, Lionel. It's good to be here. This is a great play. Yeah, it's a good evening, isn't it? Yeah. I'm glad you got a chance to see it before we set, sit down here to talk. Up, I did. And I, it's, I, I don't want to say, well, I want to say, go see it. And get ready. Because just when you think you know what's going on, and we will say nothing, everything changes, even afterwards. There are part of it that's parts that are very funny. Yes. Parts of it that were disturbing. Yes. Yeah. And how you could intertwine the two was amazing. Well, it's a, it's a good mix. I mean, Horowitz is apparently known for this. I was unaware of his work before I, before I was shown this play. But Anthony Horowitz, he, he's, uh, he's been around for a, a while. Um, I would guess he's in his 40s now, maybe. Uh, but he's written for, he wrote for the TV series Foil's War, the British television series. And he's written a series of children's books. I can't remember the title <laughs> of them. But they're not really children's books. Yes. They're like a like a, a adolescent detective mm -hmm. stories, like kind of a British Hardy Boys kind of stuff, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but he's an interesting guy. And what he's written about here, what he's chosen to write about here is fascinating. And uh, as you said, it's full of surprises I, uh, I I describe it as being Escher-esque, sort of after right. you know, M.C. Escher, Escher the, the right. illustrator, because these things fold into themselves. What looks like something mm -hmm. turns out to be something else. And uh, it's not only uh, the play is full of that. Uh, the characters, you think you know who you're listening to, mm -hmm. who you're seeing, and then you realize, oh, maybe that's not who I think it is. Maybe he's not who he presents himself to be. And... I it's one of those where I'd like to see it a couple more times. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fun, actually, because I said, yes. I said, when we were doing this, you know, people are going to want to come back and see this again. The way people go back and see The Sixth Sense again yes. or, or the film Memento, people go back and see that again. Right. And you start to try and see how things get set up. You, you see clues that are given early in, in the telling of the story, and then you realize what they mean and how they pan out later on. Well, we were, when we were walking out of the theater, people were, is it now, the... Oh, because, yeah. because nobody wants to say, am I the only one who, <laughs> am I stupid? Do I have some kind of a disability here? Did I, I'm not sure. And people say, well, that was obvious to me. Yes. I think, I'm not really yes, sure. Yes, yes, yes. No, it's interesting because apparently the discussion begins at the end of the play. I mean, people people can get quite heated in arguing about what they've seen. I've, I've heard very heated discussions in the house after the play, yes. outside the front of the theater after the play. I've been confronted by people as I come out, having done the play, who you know, have questions and, and they're asking me to corroborate their opinion versus the, the, the opinion of the person they came with. And it is so, am I right or is he right or is she right? And, you know. It is so perfectly written. You know, there's a play, a uh, movie on now, Doubt. And boy, that's a good name mm. because even that reminded me of it. But if I sat down and said, well, imagine, I could imagine Harwood saying, imagine serial killing, psychiatry, um, what? I mean, just, you, you would... If you looked under the subject matters that were addressed in this, mm. and and you, of course, as Special Agent Lundy <laughs> with Dexter, which, by the way, I, I loved it. Thank you. You ate the slowest sandwich. I want to talk to you about this one. You uh. were sitting in the park. I said, did they, t who eats a sandwich like this? I said, what is this, watercress? Eat it! You were very slow. You were very deliberate. Yes. But uh, was, there, was that merely coincidental, that uh, involvement? Wait, wait, wait. Dexter, serial killing. You know, it, well, it's interesting because uh, uh, I, I, I seem to have, I've seemed to have, in the course of my career, I seem to have come into this genre <laughs> more than once. Uh, going back to when I played Foxy Funderburk in the in the miniseries Chiefs, which was my one and only Emmy nomination. Now that was back in 1983 that I played that character. Um, but uh, and then again. Uh, the Dexter series, uh, I did a I did a three episode arc on Criminal Minds where I actually played a serial killer, um, and then uh, here I am again in in uh, in Mind Game, um, and and the subject matter is again the nature of mental illness, that particular kind of psychosis, um, what goes on in the mind of a serial killer, 
And in this particular instance, the play doesn't deal so much with that as the nature of perception mm -hmm. uh, and how, um, how mental illness can affect perception, how we see things. Is what we're mm -hmm. seeing what we actually, are we actually seeing what we think we're seeing? And that this play does a great deal to, to address that notion, not only in terms of what it talks about, what gets talked about between the characters and, and how the characters actually change during the course mm -hmm. of the play, who you think you're listening to, who you think they are, becomes a big question mark. But there are also changes that occur in the set. There are changes yes. that occur while you're watching this thing. That's another thing. I, I Believe me, just, just pay attention. That's all I say is pay, <laughs> do not have any cocktails prior to watching Mind Game. Now, Keith, I'm going to say something really stupid, and it won't be the first time, and it won't be the last time. But for those people who say, I want to be an actor, mm. they, want to be, they say, I want to be a star. Well, yes. I'm, I watched this close to see the physical pain, torment, the spit, the sweat. This is physical. This is, it was amazing. I've never been that close, seriously. It's a wonderful theater in that way, the Soho Playhouse. And, uh, you know, it's very intimate. If you want to see, if you want to really get up close and personal with, uh, with the performers, uh, this, is, this is the way to do it, you know. It's, and it's a terrific play for that reason as well, because the nature of the play itself, it's three characters, it's in a room, and uh, the, the activity is intense. The, the dialogue is intense. What's going on between these people is, is there's a lot of tension, and, uh, and you will see really, really first-rate performers, and I'm not just, obviously, I'm talking about Lee Godart and Kathleen McNenny as well as myself. You're going to see uh, the, the nature of the play because it's about psychodrama, which is mm -hmm. a, a, a form of Define therapy. That. Well, it's a, it's a form of therapy that was developed back in the 20s. I think it began in the 20s. And uh, J.L. Moreno was one of the founders, proponents of the, of the, of the idea that, that you can have people play roles in a therapeutic setting. Mm -hmm. And by role playing, get at their own neuroses, at the sources of their own anxieties. Did you learn anything new from this? Did you have an awakening or a pers because most people find because of CSI and profiling, yeah, serial killing and murderers and bad people to be interesting, crazy and what is crazy, if you think about it, therapy. Who's not in some form of therapy? I mean, it's something for everybody. Yes, I mean there was a lot of of a lot to this. And what I find so interesting about people who are very, very evil that line the banality of evil. Mm. They're not really in fact that night we were there, uh Michael Bodden, our yes, good was. friend, was on stage with Jerry Boyle, who represented Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. And Jerry Boyle, quite lighthearted about a serial killer. And there's they're unremarkable. Mm -hmm. That's what I find fascinating. Yeah, it was interesting listening to Boyle because he talked about how Dahmer was such a pleasant guy. <laughs> how the how the people that uh, you know were his his jailers. How they you know how they liked him. That he was virtually personality free. Yes, apparently was one of his comments. How about this comments. devoid? In fact, there was a there was an, uh, uh, a conversation with Jeffrey Dahmer and his father. Mm. And MSNBC plays it. You know, perpetually. Yes, I've seen that. Yeah, Doc. You know, uh, Doc Flixer, and Dahmer just sat there. Impassive, devoid, negative affect, nothing, mm -hmm. no. And what it what was interesting, what, what Jerry Boyle, his lawyer, said, he had no friends. Mm. Never had any acquaintances. And also, it was the perils of being lonely. Yes. Now, of course, the only problem with that is there are millions of lonely people well, who indeed. don't go out and do this. Indeed. Have you ever thought, uh, Keith, if, are you capable of doing this? Well, you know, one has to ask oneself these questions. When you play these roles as an actor... And it depends. Every, every actor has their own approach. But my approach is always to try and find the part of myself that is capable of the behavior that I'm being asked to replicate. 